Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this webinar on Flip Classroom, Where to Start. I'm Alan Song, the moderator for this webinar, and currently serving as part of the Escalite Executive and organizing this series of Escalite webinars. I also like to introduce my fellow Escalite Executives, Mark Northover and Chris Campbell, who are part of the Escalite webinar team, and they are here with us this afternoon. We are very glad to have Dr. Abelardo Pardo and Dr. Nagi Mirahi to facilitate this one hour webinar on flipped classroom. Dr. Abelardo Pardo is Associate Head of Teaching and Learning and Senior Lecturer at the School of Electrical and Information Engineering at the University of Sydney. Dr. Nagi Mirahi is an academic developer in the Learning and Teaching Unit and a young lecturer in the School of Education at the University of New South Wales, Australia. For this afternoon's one hour webinar, both presenters will be sharing for a couple of minutes at the start of the session and thereafter there will be a breakout session and group discussion. If you have any questions during the session, you could pose the questions in the chat box on the left, bottom left. And during question and answer session, you can also click onto the hand raising button located on the left right below the image box and I give you the right to speak. When speaking, you can click onto the talk button and after speaking, you can release the talk button. Without further ado, please help me to welcome Abelardo and Nagin. Hello everyone and welcome to the seminar. Um, the first thing I want to make sure, just in case, is uh, Verify that everybody's hearing me all right. Uh, you can do that raising your hand there in your, um, OK, I see that, yeah, enough people. Perfect. You can hear me. Excellent. All right, so we're going to proceed immediately. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here together with uh, Negin and myself. Um, this is how we have scheduled this one hour, which is probably going to be packed with a lot of things. First, we're going to give a very quick presentation on what we understand by flipped classroom and the basic elements, just to make sure we're all on the same page. And then the most important part will come, which is you participating and discussing potential outcomes from your courses to be flipped. So let me, let me go very quickly over these slides. Basically, we want to divide the seminar in three blocks. We are here with the first one very quickly. We're going to describe what it is. Then we are going to explore a little bit how are we going to unpack this flipped classroom. And finally, like I said, the most important thing, let you work and discuss in, in separate rooms, in breakout rooms with two or three more people, uh, how would you proceed, hypothetically speaking, uh, to deploy your own flipped classroom. OK, so first of all, what it is, very, very quickly. Well, flipped classroom, in fact, is nothing new. It's something that already existed before. It's basically try to see if we can make the most out of the interaction with our students and ask them to prepare something before we meet face to face. That's basically the, the essence of flipped classroom. And depends on who you ask, people will say, well, there is a lot of buzzwords going around, and flipped classroom is just one more. And I don't disagree with that. It is actually the case. I remember a long time ago trying to ask my students to do something before they come to the lecture to prepare the lecture. It's just that now we can do that differently. Um, the other reason why flipped classroom now is so popular is because we are beginning to see more and more often that this simple transfer of information, you are standing in front of somebody talking, it only achieves so much. It's not as effective as we would like. And, and the more we have been around, both Negin and myself, talking to uh, instructors and to academics, the more we realize that there is a lot of friction when you approach the lecture and you have this PowerPoint or presentation that is actually not engaging the students. And, and they are disengaged because they know that they can get a hold of that file or maybe the lecture is being recorded. Anyway, a few of the, the, the features that make the lecture not that important. There are other two um, aspects that I want you to think about when you consider why are we so much interested on, on asking students to, to perform things before they come to class. One of them is that now they can find resources everywhere. Even if you have very well-crafted PowerPoint presentation of your course, while you are presenting that in a lecture in a passive mode, they can go on the net and probably find some other presentation somewhere that is better than yours or that complements or that puts emphasis on things that they don't have clear. In other words, abundance of resources 
it's something that kind of like affects the way the lecture is deployed. And it's something worth considering. Is it possible for me to maybe capitalize on that and, and ask them to do something before they come to class? And the other big realization, and the proof of it is it's even today's engagement, is that the face-to-face -face time is, is incredibly valuable. Look, we have 57 people here in the main room in this uh, collaborate platform in Blackboard. 57 simultaneous people that left everything they're doing to pay attention to what we have to say. We have to make the most out of this time. And this is the same for your students. If you are talking to them one or two hours, you have to find a way to make that one or two hours the most productive time of the overall uh, experience. And therefore, this is another reason to um, make sure that the flipped classroom goes in that direction. Is it possible to prepare this session such that when you come here and show up, we do something that is more productive? And as you can see, this seminar, we also had our own attempt at doing that, which is we gave you some initial material. We'll get, we give you some prompt uh, questions for you to think about. Why? Because you are a busy person. You are a very busy person. If you're, if you're going to be here together with us for an hour, we want to make the most out of that. So get some things done before you come here. And that way, our discussion, our interaction will be much more productive. So this is basically a couple of factors to think about it. Some of the people, typically, when they hear about the flip class, well, they say immediately, well, I'm not convinced it's going to work. I don't think, actually, it's the adequate thing for me. And that's also a very valid point. And the approach we typically follow in this seminar is not so much telling you what you should do, but it's just making you aware of some other tool out there. Because at the end of the day, you are the professional. You make the decisions. But you have to be aware of the tools that are out there. And probably part of your job requirement is to select the right tool for the right environment. So knowing the tricks or knowing how to deploy a flipped classroom is definitely something valuable that you have to keep in your pocket or in your professional portfolio of tricks. Um, a little bit more connected with uh, pedagogy is the following reason. So typically, what we ask the students is to cover certain cognitive uh, tasks. And these cognitive tasks can be derived or can be classified depending on the level of complexity. And I'm showing to you in this slide six levels of complexity. The simplest one is at the bottom. The more complex one is at the top. This is what is known as the Bloom Revised Taxonomy. And we increase in levels of complexity. So the simplest thing is to present certain concepts for the students just to remember, to remember certain basic pieces of whatever topic you are covering. A bit more complex is to ask them to understand these topics. Typically, it's a bit more complex to apply certain procedures, because it requires to connect what they have understood before. So the application sits there uh, in the third level. If we go to the next level up, Sometimes we ask our students to analyze a certain topic or analyze a certain issue. Analyzing requires to be aware of how to apply certain procedures or concepts, and definitely they need to understand them and remember them. And if we co keep going up in the, in the Bloom taxonomy, a more sophisticated task would be to evaluate, which will allow them to uh, compare two approaches and decide which one is the best. And at the end, typically at the top of this uh, building, we have the creation phase, where we ask them to create something new. Again, this is very generic. It's not a specific for one topic. But you get a little bit of this sense of gradual approach. And you also get the sense that the bottom levels are the simple one. Typically, the way we approach this is that in conventional lectures, we tell the students a few things to remember, and we try to make sure they understand. And that's what we do in class. And then we have some additional tasks or resources that we aim at covering the other layers. Maybe you don't cover all of them in your course, but typically we use other assignments or something that happens after the lecture to apply, analyze, maybe ask them to evaluate or to create. Then, the question that pops up is, can we do better than this or not? And if we can do better than this, we may need to replace or reallocate these activities in different stages. So this is basically a question of telling you, all right, what would be the success criteria for you when you finish a lecture? What is the notion of a successful lecture for you? And um, let me just, OK. I need somebody to mute the microphone because I'm getting a lot of feedback from the audio and I'm getting confused here. OK, thank you. All right. So going back to this notion of what is the success for your lecture? If the success for your, or, or the, the criteria to define a successful lecture, if the criteria is just cover the whole material in the allotted time, 
then the pressure is on you just to go fast like I'm doing right now with all these slides, right? But typically you go to go you need to go beyond that. You need to make sure that it is a success from the student point of view, that they really understood the concept, that they, the, the lecture was useful to, to understand, perhaps to apply, perhaps to, to cover more cognitively challenging levels of that Bloom's taxonomy. And this is precisely what we try with the flip approach. With the flip approach, we want to move the basic levels of the Bloom taxonomy, remember understanding and perhaps applying as much as possible to pre-assignments, to things that happen before students come to class. And then, during the lecture, we'll try to squeeze in there, we'll try to schedule different tasks, different activities, which of course are much more participatory, which of course are different from just the lecturer or the instructor presenting things. And we'll try to address them and design in such that the students analyze and perhaps evaluate. And they are in a position to evaluate different approaches to a problem because previously they understood the basic concepts, they remember the basic facts, and perhaps they also practice some applications of some procedures that you have in your topic. Again, what we're asking from you is to generalize what I am discussing and try to make it from the generic terms in which I'm talking to the specific scenario you might have in mind when you approach your class. And I'm guessing that all 50, how many we have? Oh, we have 66 participants right now. All 66 of each one of you will have a different scenario. And you have to translate or, or um, connect these levels that I'm mentioning here with whatever is appropriate to your context. Very briefly, um, does this work or not? And the good news is that it's like any other approach. When you deploy it properly, it's been known to work in certain instances, instances and when you don't deploy it properly, uh, it's not working as expected. So from that point of view, I think it's up there with other tools or other techniques. Does problem-based learning work? Well, it depends. If you deploy properly, it's very likely that it will give you a very good or, or um, satisfactory learning experience. But if not, problem-based learning is risky or uh, it might not work. Flip classroom, it is the same. And you will begin to see in the literature papers describing scenarios in which the gains are substantial and also some others in which the gains are not as big as expected. So from that point of view, I personally think that gives me a, a, some sort of peace of mind knowing that there is people finding out that it works and that it doesn't. That makes it very realistic, at least for me, in my case. All right, so moving on, like I said, this is just the brief introduction. This is just to make sure we're all on the same page. This is just to make sure that um, we resonate with these things. Now, um, we want to push you to the phase in which we discuss this. Is. And again, one hour seminar is a very short time, so we're going very fast and pushing a lot of material. Um, as you can see, today's session has been flipped. We ask you please to review some videos. Uh, we ask you to try to identify a learning outcome. The reason why we ask you that is this is the latching point where we will ask you to rethink about that learning outcome. Learning outcome means that you have to guarantee that your students are capable of doing something specific by the time they end certain interaction with you or in your course. All right, so the learning outcome will be the initial point, will be the token that you have to keep in your mind and say, all right, what can I do to start scheduling activities before they come to class, before they meet face to face, that are working our way gradually to achieve that outcome, and we are targeting those lower levels of the Bloom taxonomy, uh, remembering, understanding, and perhaps applying. What we're going to ask you next is to think about what kind of previous activities will support the learning outcome, what kind of activities then will you come up with during the class, and a little bit to think about what happens after the class. So we want you to picture yourself in the new environment in which you have these three stages. Um, this is another illustration that might help you. Uh, it has a, a bit of a concrete setting, but you are free to modify whatever you need. You have three spaces that are, the students are traversing over time. The learning outcome out, at the top is driving or shaping these three spaces. The spaces are before class, during class, after class. Uh, feel free to remove any of these spaces if they don't apply to you. Like, for example, after class, I, I'm not going to ask my students to do anything. And we also want you to think in terms of two possibilities. What kind of activities I'm going to propose to them? 
how am I going to tackle that learning outcome? And the bottom part is what kind of assessment, if I have um, the opportunity to ask them for assessment, what kind of assessment am I going to be proposing? And as you can see, the first block we labeled first exposure, second block practice and feedback, third block further exploration. These are terms that are popular in the literature on learning on um, flipped classroom. And this is just to help you frame the discussion. And of course, you can think, if you want to, that this should perhaps lead to some summative assessment. And you could place that after these three blocks. And of course, summative assessment, good practice rule says that it should be somewhat aligned, reasonably aligned with the learning outcome. OK. Um, I think I covered this in less time than I initially thought. But I'm, I'm really worried, or I'm really keen on, uh, and both Negan and I discussed this uh, before, to give you enough time for you to discuss, to discuss in these breakout uh, rooms. So the plan, again, this is where you come, work, and then we reconvene and discuss back, back with you with all 69 attending people right now. Um, we suggest that you follow these four steps in your discussion. The first one is make sure you first share the learning outcome with each other. Try to be brief. In other words, do not elaborate this uh, outcome over time and time because we don't have that much uh, time to discuss it. So it has to be something brief. Let me give you an example. In my class, I want my students, it's an engineering course, to be able to uh, manipulate digital gates. That would be my, my outcome. And digital gates have some complexities, and they have some procedures that they need to be aware of. And they have to be able then to analyze circuits that are made with those gates. That would be my outcome, something like that. And then start thinking about the type of pre-class or preparation activities that come to mind. And then very important, in-class activities. Because one of the main consequences of the flip paradigm that catches pretty much everybody by surprise is the fact that once you kind of understand or, or are comfortable with the idea of providing students with engaging activities to prepare, then you'll realize that you cannot go back to your lecture and do the usual presentation of your PowerPoint. It has to be something much more cognitively challenging in the um, in Bloom's taxonomy. And therefore, what we are faced with when we adopt this paradigm is we tend to get very satisfied with some interesting pre preparatory tasks or pre-class pre activities. And then we realize that we need to redesign our in-class tasks. So we want you to cover both of them. OK, so the next step then. We're going to see how uh, we're going to push a little bit the technology. We're going to push Blackboard Collaborate to create probably around 25 breakout rooms. You are going to be randomly grouped by groups of three. And what we want to happen in these breakout rooms is first, do you share the learning outcome, as we mentioned, see if it is suitable for a single lecture, a uh, single session, um, discuss a little bit how you plan to measure that. And then you share your current approach and the resources you have with the rest of your um, colleagues in that room and see and start exploring how that outcome can be flipped. Let me hand it over to Negin to see if she wants to clarify a bit more the tasks. Negin. Thanks, Abelardo. Um, yes, as Abelardo mentioned, we're going to put you into groups of three. Hopefully, within your groups of three, one or two of you have actually brought a learning outcome with you um, to discuss in today's session. Um, it can be a learning outcome for a single class. It doesn't necessarily have to be a learning outcome that you would be covering entire course or an entire semester. So think carefully about what you would want as a particular aim for a single lesson or at most a couple of lessons. So we'll put you into the breakout rooms. When you get into your breakout rooms, introduce yourselves to the other two people that might be in there. Do a quick check to see if your audio is working. If you don't have audio today, you can also use the chat. Um, you have your own chat space specific to your breakout group. Um, so whatever you chat in there doesn't show up in other groups. Um, and then Abelardo and myself, as well as Chris and Mark, will be coming in and out of 
your groups to see how you're doing, if you have any questions, um, and how we might be able to help you. So we will be coming in and um, seeing how you're going in the groups. Now there's two steps to the activity. The first one is the one that you see on the screen there that Abelardo described. After about 10 minutes, we'll ask you to go to step two. Step two is now where you're really going to be engaging about how you could actually flip that particular lesson. What would be advantageous for the students to be doing face to face when they're with you? What would be better for them to do before coming to the class um, individually, perhaps? And what would you want them to do afterwards? Um, what sort of activities, what sort of preparation you might have to do? So for example, if you want them to watch um, a short lecture video, what sort of preparation is required? And thinking really about how the activities you want your students to do, both outside of the class, and in the class, how that relates to the learning outcome that you've identified, and then what sort of challenges you have. We'll give you some time to do that, about 10 minutes or so. And then we'll bring everybody back into the main room. And we'll ask for volunteers to share some of the ideas and strategies that they've come up with, um, as well as to hear about any challenges that you've identified. And hopefully, collectively, we can brainstorm some ideas around that. So, just before we put you into the breakout rooms, is there any questions, anything that's not clear? Um, I thought I would give you just a, you know, a minute to see if there's any questions that you have before we start putting into you into the breakout rooms. We'll also send, oh, we have a question. Go ahead. <laughs> We've got four people in our webinar, even though they're on the one on A9. Um, I was the only one who um, enrolled in the webinar, but I've got three of my colleagues with me. With me. Oh, four of us. Um, would it be okay if we talked amongst ourselves as a group, or did you want us to mix with the others in the webinar? It would probably be best if you could also engage with the others um, who will, will put you into the, the breakout rooms. Um, because we have such a large group with us today, we're going to randomly put you into groups. Um, maybe once you're put into a group, see how the other two people are doing. And if um, you can suggest maybe if you wanted to step out and work with the colleagues you have with you um, face to face. Um, or if you want to engage with the two that are in there. So um, let's put you into the breakout room first and then see how you go. Are there any other questions before we put you into the groups? OK, so just bear with us. It'll take um, probably at most a minute um, to put you all into the groups. And we'll send through the instructions as well so you'll see them in the, in the space.